Well, thank you for having me here today. And uh, I hope that today, our time together will inspire you and your garden. And hopefully you think about gardening in a different way. And what you're about to hear is really a story of people and plants, hope and hard work and redemption. I, this story proves that gardening can change lives and that it can actually be an escape. And um, I want you to think about just how often you interact with a plant during your day if you don't actually have your own garden. Uh, but before we begin, um, I just want to ask you all what you think of when you hear the word Alcatraz. What pops into your mind? Cell block. Cell block. <laughs> Prison. The Rock. Maybe Sean Connery. Um, very few people ever say gardens, and uh, when we finish today, hopefully that's the first thing that pops into your mind. Uh, but before we start, um, I just want to share with you a few little facts about Alcatraz that you may not have known. Um, we have 4.5 acres of gardens on the island. The island itself is only about 22 and a half acres in size. We have the first lighthouse on the whole west coast on Alcatraz, and we get 1.5 million visitors every year to the island. That's about 5,000 people a day. And um, we're also going to start with um, just a little history lesson first. And um, if you've ever heard of this, the book and the movie, The Secret Gardens, our Alcatraz gardens are kind of like that. It's not the first thing that pops into your head, and um, it's really an unlikely place for there to be gardens. We want you, when you come out, to really think gardens. We don't want you to miss them. Most people are heading up to the cell block, and they walk by all the terraces. They don't stop to look over the edge. And this is where the gardens are. Um, if you get off the, the beaten track and actually slow down, um, listen to the docents telling you where the tours are and where the open gardens are, those are the people that really get to experience Alcatraz. So I want you to keep in mind, Alcatraz has actually been a home for people right from 1854 right up until 1971. Um, this is just a little shot of some children who grew up on the island. And um, we're going to start with our history. And this is actually the first picture of Alcatraz. It really is um, a bare rock made up of gray wackle sandstone. And no fresh water, um, just the winter rains and the fog drip. It really is the most unlikely place that you could ever picture having a garden out here. It's not likely that Native Americans lived here. Um, it was a bird colony, and most likely they stopped and gathered the eggs. So with the start of um, gold was discovered in 1849, and the military saw Alcatraz as the perfect place for a fortress. Um, this is how the military shaped the island with roadways and a fortress on top of it. They actually brought the soil in place to hold cannons, and um, with that, a few of the native seeds came in. Our first garden picture, though, is 1869, and this is the military structure that sat at the very top of the island, the citadel. And in front, you can just see it's a normal Victorian scene, the ladies in their big dresses. And it's hard to believe that this is actually on Alcatraz. But when you're sent to an island, um, the first thing is natural to make it a home, and the women wanted to garden to soften the rock. And so they started bringing in their favorite garden plants and stealing some of that soil to make it a garden for themselves. When the Civil War started, the island actually turned into a military prison. So now you have guards, and um, the women and children are still living there. But then you also have prisoners on the island. And for the women, just gardening and raising their family was just a natural thing for them to do. So in the background here, you can see Angel Island. And the gardens are very ornate and they're very Victorian looking. In 1881, uh, three homes were built for the highest ranking officers. And this, um, with the privilege of being a high ranking officer, they had their own garden, um, their high view up on the hill looking out over the bay. And on a small island, having your own garden was actually you know, really a privilege. And you notice all the detail of the cannons there. They decorated with whatever they could. 
Theodore Roosevelt was president when the cell house was started in 1908 and finished in 1912. When it was actually constructed at the time, it was the world's largest steel reinforced concrete structure. So pretty, pretty amazing construction even back then. The military inmates actually helped build this building. And once it was completed, they were the lucky ones to be able to move into their new homes, their little five by nine cells. Uh, with the building boom of the 20s, um, the island started to take on a little shantytown look. Uh, not everyone was really pleased with the progress, though. Uh, back then, the city of San Francisco, just a bustling town, really didn't like the look that the military was taking, um, cluttering up their bay, their beautiful views. So they actually started pressuring the military to beautify the island. And the military offered a vocational training for the inmates. Um, part of that effort, um, the inmates got trained in gardening, um, learning how to plant seeds and shrubs. Um, the California Wildflower and Botanical Society, or Blossom Society, sorry, uh, donated trees and shrubs. Um, the drosanthemum you see in this picture, the pink ice plant, was part of that effort. So it was planted on the south side of the island to face the city and give a nice cheerful pink face. Um, you can see this all the way from the city and even from the Golden Gate Bridge. With the Depression, um, the crime rate really skyrocketed. Um, and prohibition combined rose the gangster era. And the military gave over the island to the federal penitentiary to create the maximum security prison. And this is the time that most people are familiar with. Um, Al Capone, all those inmates got sent there. And you actually had to earn your way to Alcatraz. Um, you had to be behaving badly at another prison to get sent to Alcatraz. And then once you were there, um, through punishment and confinement, you were corrected, and then you were sent back to finish out your sentence at the first prison that you came from. Um, so the island took on a different look of the guard towers, of the gates, and it really was a harsh place to be. But I just want to introduce you to a gentleman now, uh, Freddie Reichel. He was the secretary to the very first warden. And he was a single man on the island and didn't have much to do in his spare time in the evening. Uh, he actually took an interest in what the military had left behind in terms of the gardens. And he lived down in one of the cottages on the parade ground, the very first one right there at the bottom. And uh, he started gardening behind his home. Um, very novice garden, just learned by trial and error. Uh, it didn't take him long, though, to realize that he couldn't keep up with what the military had done. And uh, he wondered, like, where could he find people with time on their hands to help out? Um, sure enough, he looked up the hill and saw a whole building of people just sitting there. So he got permission from the warden um, for these maximum security inmates to work in the gardens, work with tools and knives and um, shears. And uh, they actually turned out to be a really reliable um, work gardeners out there. Just like my, um, the inmates back then, we also rely on community gardeners to come out and help care for the gardens. Um, when we took on the project, we knew we couldn't do it alone. There's so much out there. So just like the inmates, uh, the gardeners learned about something different, um, an excuse to be outside in the fresh air, doing something different, meeting different people. And uh, the inmates then were most likely looking for ways to escape once they were outside. Uh, my um, volunteers kind of look for ways to get to the island for excuses to come out. And uh, it's a whole different, really sweet community now that we have. Um, but for these inmates, if they weren't outside gardening, having a job was a privilege. Um, if you got out of your cell, yeah, you know, you were doing something productive. Um, if you did not have a job, though, you'd be inside for 20 hours in your little five by nine cell. The uh, island would eventually close in 1963. The prison shut down. Um, the crumbling walls and the salt air really were taking a toll. Um, if you've ever watched that movie, Escape from Alcatraz, where they're tunneling through the back of the cell block, that's actually true. And it was just too expensive to maintain any longer. So after 29 years of it being a maximum security prison, it shut down, uh, with it being processed of 1,545 inmates during its time as a prison. Um, at any one time, there's only 260 inmates out there, and the average length of stay would be about eight years for an um, for inmate. 
the inmates actually had two main complaints, uh, the constant cold and the rule of silence. So if you can imagine eight years of silence, and that's your punishment, being in a little five by nine cell, um, the privilege of gardening was uh, pretty lucky. In uh, 1971, it actually became a part of the national park system and um, after brief occupation by Native Americans. So this became part of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And this is an early picture in 1972. Um, in the very center of the screen, you can see an actual ranger tour being led. Um, back then, people were so fascinated with Alcatraz. Even today, they are. Um, this is the first time people were allowed on the island as civilians. There is great mystery around the island. No one really knew what had gone on out there, and they were just really curious about finding out for themselves what had taken place. Uh, back then, everyone was led around in tours, um, very controlled about where you could go, where you couldn't. But um, looking at this aerial, you can see all the bright pink. So that Drosanthemum is still surviving. The dark pink is a pelagonium, a geranium. And you can even see a lot of the agaves um, still hanging on. So it really is an unexpected place for there to be gardens. Um, the harshness of the wind, and after the prison shut down, those gardens just sat vacant. And um, it really took a lot of effort to get them going again and to really tell those stories that those people had uh, been out there with. Um, so really, what happened to the gardens? How do we get to where we are now? Um, imagine that you find a picture of your grandmother's garden, and you're standing in her garden, and it's looking like this. You go off that picture, and you want to just recreate. Um, we kind of had to do the same thing, except you find out you have to ask all your family members, you know, what do you think? Can we go ahead with this? Um, we have the same thing, except our family happens to be the National Park Service, uh, historians, historic landscape architects, and everyone needs to weigh in, everyone needs to agree, and then you can go ahead and carry out your plan. So in 2003, um, we managed to do just that. Uh, it was a partnership of the National Park Service, the Garden Conservancy, and the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy. Finally came together. There was enough movement and interest to restore the gardens and to tell the softer side of the island's history. So with that, um, we had a plan. Um, we went and surveyed the island about what, where were the gardens and what could we restore that would best tell the story. So the gardens happen to be all over the island. Um, one of the most common questions I get are, where are the gardens? And it's those people that just have walked by without looking over the railing to see for themselves. But the main road, officer's row, the rose terrace, and then you come around to the west side to look at the cell house slope. The whole west side is garden where the prisoners used to garden. We also needed to be very clear with our mission. Uh, we wanted to preserve and maintain the gardens created by those who lived on the island during both the military and the prison penitentiary eras and interpret their history, the horticulture, and the cultural significance. Um, I do want to add that the Al Alcatraz Gardens are actually the only cultural stewardship project in the park. So it's a program where volunteers come in and actually steward a cultural landscape versus um, a natural one where you're promoting habitat. So that's very unique for us. Alcatraz is a national historic landmark, so we needed to be very clear, focused on what we were aiming to do. Um, we had two guiding documents um, that are important to mention for the preservation that we do. Um, the cultural landscape report on the left here was kind of, um, uh, like an emergency plan. The longer that we waited, more of the plants were disappearing, more of the hardscape was fracturing under the harsh conditions out there. So this was a survey. Um, over 200 species of plants were still surviving on the island with all that overgrowth. And we determined those five areas to best focus on. Um, documented all the existing plants, all the features. And then later on, um, in 2010, the cultural landscape report was developed um, on the right here. This report is the one that we now follow, and this outlines the next 20 years of work for us. So there's um, a lot that we haven't done yet. So there's still years of work to be done, which is exciting to think of. 
Um, so for each of the areas, the five areas, we came up with a treatment plan. Um, the treatment plans take about two months to prepare. Um, they get presented to the National Park Service, the cultural uh, review people. Um, each report covers the history of that particular garden, including all the maps, photos that we can find. We next document everything that's there existing. And then the next chapter includes our plans, what we're gonna do with it. So plants, a watering, the maintenance, um, funding, um, how much it's gonna cost, all of that gets put together and presented. Once we get approval for that, then we can go ahead and actually do the work. So um, we're all really gardeners at heart, everyone involved in the project, and we really just wanted to get our hands dirty and dive right into that overgrowth. Um, this is the late Carola Ashford standing in the center, and she's actually looking at a photo of, his, of the garden they're standing in uh, with two volunteers, and as they clear away the overgrowth, they can actually find that stairs that shows up in that photograph. So it's really exciting. Um, that's probably one of the best parts of the whole job, clearing away um, you know, ivy that's covered up some feature for the past 40 years. Speaking of my volunteers, I like to think they come for the work and the enjoyment, but the views are pretty fantastic out there. Um, it's hard to beat. Uh, we have two regular drop-in programs that you have to register for. Uh, we take everyone who wants to come as long as you can commit to two months, uh, Wednesdays and Fridays, and then we also have a docent program too that runs. Uh, we have logged last year just over 8,000 volunteer hours just gardening alone. So. Um, with two, one and a half staff on the island to look after the gardens. It really, truly does rely on volunteer gardeners, and they are carrying out the mission of Freddie Reichel back then of wanting to care for a landscape. Um, do any of you take photos of your garden? Because we take tons. Um, I'm just going to walk you through some of our before and afters and tell you about some of the challenges that we had for each of the areas. Uh, we first started in 2003, clearing away the overgrowth along the main road. So this was a military era, um, 1800s. This is when this was done. So we wanted to clear away the overgrowth and retell that period of history. Um, this is how we found it, just covered in blackberries and the walnut trees there. Uh, 2014, um, we managed to turn it around and now it's blooming. There's always something in bloom out there. Um, in this f photo, um, this particular bed, it's really full of survivor plants, we call them. So these are the plants that manage to cope on their own without any, you know, anyone caring for them, any extra water, any pruning. These are the true hardy hardy. If you want to plant a garden in this area, this is what you plant. Um, so we have casmanthi, um, the jacinthemum with nasturtium covering it over, acanthus, all Mediterranean plants that you would expect to find in this area. But surprisingly, we also had a lot of roses and iris too that still managed to cope on their own. Uh, part of the main road is that trough. Um, if you remember back to that photo of the three officers row homes, that line of cannonballs was actually this, um, this trough. Um, they got rid of the line of cannonballs and they uh, put the planter on top filled with flowers. Um, they actually got rid of the homes um, in the 1940s with the change of the prison. Um, the maximum inmates didn't make the best neighbors any longer. So they took away those homes and made gardens in the foundations. So here's a little bit more work on the trough. It had to be scooped out of oxalis corms, uh, repaired, and then finally replanted with other polygoniums from the 1940s that we had found. Um, the seagulls, I have to say, really did like them. They actually, uh, one of our biggest challenge are the gulls. Um, they want to claim their territory and they love the plants to take that with. Um, but that being said, we don't have gophers, deer, or any of that stuff, so I'll take the gulls. Uh, this is the officer's row. This is one of those foundations of the home that was removed. Uh, this is the officer's, the medical officer's wife, Mrs. Casey. And when she wasn't busy in her own home, she got to work outside in her garden. Um, it's now a cutting garden again. And looking at the photo, we tried to replicate those, the colors. Um, here's another, this is the officer's home for the medical officer. Uh, that one burned down at the native occupation and now Fortunately, it's a restroom, but um, the garden in front of it, the terraces, uh, is still there. 
Uh, this is when we cleared it away of overgrowth. You can see the same, uh, the railing is still there, um, the still the same curve. And uh, once again, when it's replanted, it really does bloom, um, looking completely different. A few of the inmates I said were lucky enough to be gardeners outside. Uh, so here's one working, just watering. Um, so I think it really was a privilege to be outside working with that. And again, the same garden in the early morning light. Uh, next, we focused on the Rose Terrace. Um, back in the military, this was where they had their greenhouse. And um, it's hard to show, like we only have this really one photo of this garden. Um, so we tried to look at it and pick out the plants identified from a black and white photo. Uh, we did pretty well, but we wanted to just keep the focus of it being um, the center of gardening operation. So. First, we scattered it out. Um, here's Corolla again with the first horticulturist. And uh, they're looking for any evidence of a garden. So the grassy area in the foreground had been cleared once. That's why there's grass and not all the blackberry. But they found a lot of interesting things down there, um, like home areas and little bulbs that wouldn't be there otherwise. Um, looking back, here's the same view. We had to widen the road just for a truck to drive in and make it usable for us but the eucalyptus tree is still there in the back. Uh, we even rebuilt the greenhouse. Um, this is a few volunteers and myself from many years ago, it looks like. But uh, this is um, the historic one in the foreground. And we wanted to rebuild it, but not look exactly like the old one, because we don't want to confuse people about what's new and what's rebuilt. Um, this one actually came as a flat pack kit down from Canada, so it arrived in the mail. And uh, the guys really loved this project, a building project they could actually see a result from. Um, you know, watching the volunteers, just kind of taking a step back and letting them figure it out. You know, it always turns out great, but for this, they had all the boxes ripped open, and then parts were being put together, realized it didn't quite work, and then they started reading the, the directions. So it was, <laughs> it was very typical, but it was very funny. And of course, what would a rose garden be without roses? Uh, this is the rare Alcatraz rose, that very famous in the garden world, and this one has a great story. Um, it was found growing behind the warden's house and by a group of rosarians actually in 1989. Uh, cuttings were taken and was growing up. Um, when we were ready to plant the rose garden, we got this rose back from the native plant nursery in the Presidio who had been tending it all these years. Uh, in the meantime, um, with the millennium coming, um, in, go back to year 2000, the Welsh Museum of Life, or Welsh Museum of Life in Cardiff, Wales, was actually building a rose garden, and they were looking for this particular rose. Um, they couldn't find it anywhere in Europe at all. Like it really was considered extinct, and somehow they found it out about Northern California growers having this rose. Um, so they were able to send the rose back to Cardiff, and the first try it got lost in the mail and died. But the second time, I actually made it, and now this is growing back in Wales. Um, we actually had a volunteer from Wales who went home, took a picture of it, and sent it to us. So uh, we know it's there, and it's one of those unknown stories. We don't know who brought it or how it ended up behind the warden's house, but um, it's a great story. So not only the people have stories, but the plants too. Uh, next, we went to that cell house slope. Um, if you remember that pink, sunny, cheerful uh, face towards the city from the military, this is how it was and what we've been able to do with it again. Um, this whole slope, I have to say, was planted with oxalis, um, the tiny yellow buttercup. Maybe you're familiar with it. But my volunteers spent hours and hours, and thank God for them, and they're right here in the front, um, weeding it. Because it, it takes the dedication year after year to like pull it, just to pull it, and not have it swallowed back up again. Um, but it gets better every year, even with the drought of the past four years. This has been absolutely fine. It hasn't even phased it whatsoever. Um, last year, you could actually see it from the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a good six miles away. So um, it really is a cheerful sight. 
I also want to introduce you to Elliot Michener, um, one of our favorite inmate gardeners. Um, Elliot has a great story, too. Um, he was actually convicted for counterfeiting. Uh, this is back in the Depression. He had been working as a newsprint, um, you know, in uh, newsprint offices. And uh, he just thought he could print his own money. So <laughs> it wasn't very good. Um, he did end up serving 30 years or being sentenced to 30 years in Leavenworth Prison. Um, he was unfortunately involved in an escape attempt. And that earned him the trip to Alcatraz. So I said that you had to earn your way to Alcatraz. That was his ticket. And in a way, it was a little ticket to freedom, too. Um, once he actually arrived on Alcatraz, um, the guards didn't realize he actually wasn't such a bad guy. Um, he actually found a set of keys on the ground one day, um, picked them up, and I know what I would do if I was serving 30 years. Uh, he actually turned them in, and that gave him the privilege of being a gardener outside then. Um, he was outside, first of all, to pick up those handballs that people had been playing with in the rec yard during their, their outside time. Um, finding those keys, though, and turning them back in was probably the best thing he could have ever done. He was really a novice gardener again. Um, he didn't know anything. He just knew he liked being outside, doing something different. And uh, he started gardening be below the watchtower. Um, you know, they didn't trust him completely, of course. But he started here and uh, just started gardening away. Um, the guards saw blisters on his hands and actually gave him gloves. And, uh, you know, had a little bit of sympathy for this guy who was just trying to grow a flower. The guards really just wanted to keep them busy, too. So they were happy to let this guy go crazy. Um, over the next eight years he spent, he really terraced the whole hillside. And uh, lucky for him, he actually became the warden's houseboy. So he got to do the gardening and the landscaping um, for the warden and his wife, made their meals, um, cleaned up their house a little bit. Uh, he actually built the warden's wife, Mrs. Swope, here a greenhouse that you see right behind her. So, you know, in a really way, weird way, he actually really helped him being out there. Uh, this is what Elliot managed to create himself. He salvaged pieces together for his own greenhouse and created this beautiful cottage garden. Um, really, again, in the most unlikely place ever, on the harshest prison, having the harshest climate, you have this beautiful flowering garden. Um, we have this great quote from Elliot. Um, the hillside provided a refuge from disturbances of the prison, the work a release, and it became an obsession. This one thing I would do well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's really powerful that he, through all his trials and tribulations, he managed to just kind of find himself, you know, the worst place, your bottom, you hit rock bottom, and you have this hope of gardening, and you cling onto it, and it changes your life completely. <clears throat> Elliot eventually did get uh, rehabilitated. His um, behavior was considered changed through his gardening, and he did get sent back to Leavenworth to finish out his sentence. Uh, we found a letter, actually, from Elliot to the warden begging to come back to Alcatraz. He missed his garden so much. At Leavenworth, he was just doing the mundane task of checking off the days. But um, on Alcatraz, he was actually doing something that he liked. Um, he was never allowed to come back, though. Um, the prison rules were very strict. And um, we know he got paroled to a dairy farm. He then went on to LA to become a gardener on a golf course down there. And uh, when he came back, he walked through his garden again with Russ Beatty, who was doing a, a Gardens of Alcatraz book. Um, this is what he would have seen, though, um, his gardens being neglected. Um, he did see, though, his fig tree that he planted and a couple of apple trees. And uh, he could remember back to those days when he had um, a part of this landscape. So this is we, as we found it, 2007. Um, 2015, it's been completely redone, blooming again. Uh, people walking through this garden now can appreciate what Elliot has created, and uh, it would have been nice for Elliot to see this as well. Other inmates were lucky enough to be involved in the gardening. Um, they terrace a lot of the hillsides out there, and really, keep in mind, these are people who are not gardeners whatsoever. And there's gladiolas in there, a lot of Shasta daisies, um, some Uriops, it looks like. 
<clears throat> and again, that same garden as we found it. And blooming again. So it really is so satisfying to look back at those old photos of the neglect and be able to stand and talk to people in the garden and have them standing beside a blooming garden. <laughs> we also did um, the rec yard slope stairs and the bird bath garden, we call it. And these gardens, um, completely eroding, this is where the inmates would have walked through and on their way to work and what we've been able to do with it again. And there's the bird bath we've recreated in the bottom corner. So there's a lot of, um, let's see what's in here, um, nasturtiums, a lot of pelagoniums, osteospermum, some yarrow, and uh, really good plants for the windiest side of the island. And of course, underneath all that overgrowth, we found some really cool stuff. Um, I can only think Elliot got busy gardening because he missed a lot of handballs. And even now, like a good 14 years later, we're still finding handballs. And it's really cool finding the black balls that you see up here. Because um, you know the last person who held one of those was actually an inmate playing ball. And we never will know when we have found the last one. So it's like when one bobs up, it's kind of cool. We also found a lot of spoons, um, bottles, um, some random nails. We have found probably one of the weirdest things, kind of cool, was kind of um, a spoon with a little kirk in the um, a finger hold for it right outside of the metal detector. So you can kind of guess maybe somebody was thinking of using it as a weapon and then got scared right before the metal detector and dropped it. We're also really focused on sustainability out there. Um, I know it's hard to believe with all the rain lately, but back in, I think 2009 it was, we installed this water catchment. And it's 12,000 gallons that it holds. Uh, we actually reused um, 2,000 gallons to be here, this is actually the gray water settling tanks from the prison showers. Um, in addition to that, we added the green tanks on the lawn. Totally, that's 12,000, and that matches what we use on the west side for one whole year. So um, we had been draining it before the end of the year, and uh, the soil was never saturated with the drought of the past four years. So this year is hopefully, um, you know, saturating the soil, and we've already got our tanks filled, so um, it should be a really good year coming up. Uh, we also do composting. Uh, we're very focused on that, and I have a little video clip. Um, we're on an island, and we actually don't have any space, and we're really short on water. Composting is a really big part of what we do. Uh, we're into sustainable gardening. And that's what composting is all about. My process is a hot composting process. I get my bins to 140 to 160 degrees. It's essential for breaking down the material in a timely fashion. And also it's essential for killing weed seeds so that when we put it back into the soil, we're not gonna go back to the weeds. Actually, the tea we make is actually worm composting tea. I have a worm farm out here, as well as regular compost. What we do with a worm farm is harvest the castings, the worm castings, and we make worm poop tea, and that material is used as a spray. Uh, it's a nice um, spray for pest control. It provides microorganisms to make the plants a lot healthier. That's my world famous tea. Um, I just want to add, Dick, he's our worm man of Alcatraz, and uh, he enters our compost every year into the Marin County Fair. He's a resident of uh, San Anselmo. Uh, for the past five years, he's won. Um, unfortunately, this past year, he lost to his wife, who entered her own compost. So he, uh, he taught her well. <laughs> Uh, so back to our inmates. Um, so the inmates who had jobs would walk down those stairs that I'd shown you and through the garden, the birdbath garden. And um, I really want you to picture, if you were walking through this garden, this is the only bit of greenery you'd have in your whole entire day. 
every day, ever, for years and years. And that's what walking through this garden meant a lot to these gentlemen. Um, a few of them would actually pick a little posy of flowers and take back to their cell, you know, giving up their little glass of drinking water, taking the slack from their neighbors for having flowers. And um, it really meant a lot for these guys to get out of the stinky cell where you could actually smoke still. So, you know, try to think of what it would be like to be inside. And to walk through here, you see the city, you smell it, um, you smell chocolate wafting over from the city, um, birds, you know, everything is going on. There's so much life outside. Uh, we regrew that garden. The birdbath is still in here. Um, you have the callas, the ursimium, and the osteospermum in front. And uh, these are mostly like the best time of year is springtime. That's when everything is just going going crazy. Um, one of those inmates actually had the luxury of painting watercolors as a pastime. And he chose to paint that same scene. Um, you can see the water, the birdbath down there in the corner. And uh, this gentleman, George Heck, he was in for bank robbery. So he was serving 10 years. Um, he had been married but when he went into prison. Uh, his wife was very patiently waiting. And uh, they dreamed of their future. Um, he finished his time. They went on and they had a family together. Uh, that family, years later, was going through the attic after they'd passed away, after the parents had passed. And they found a series of watercolors, this being one of them. Um, they recognized the city, the city uh, escape there, all the tall buildings. And so they knew this was San Francisco, but they just couldn't really figure out, like, where, where was this taken from? And um, they finally figured it was Alcatraz. But, you know, talk about big family secrets. They had no idea their father was there. Um, it was a big, you know, just imagine yourself if you, you know you find that out but George knew one day um, his kids would find the photos the paintings he'd done but he couldn't bear to throw away something he loved um, so you know it was his choice to keep them or to throw them out and have a secret safe but he really chose to keep them um, so I think the gardens really meant a lot to people that um, gets missed if you're just on the the cell house tour so I think the next time, I hope anyway, that you think of the Alcatraz, um, think of the gardens, you know, think of Freddie Reichel caring for something that somebody else had left behind. Um, think about Elliot and how he changed his life around. You know, think about my volunteers working out there, rain or shine, and uh, how we're trying to carry on Freddie's mission. And uh, I really hope um, you get involved with us too. So I mentioned that we have volunteer days every Wednesday and Friday. Um, you're very welcome to come out. Um, we always work like this, smiling. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's a great place to be, to meet new friends if you're new to the city. And we don't require you have any skill whatsoever. So um, as long as you can commit to two months, um, we really do need docents too. So if you like talking to people, sharing, like you'll meet people from all over the world. Um, you know, I have my card come up and speak with me after that. Um, but if you're not up to gardening, um, we really do want you to come visit. So picking up a self-guided brochure, um, I do have uh, one at your seat there. Um, you can walk around on a self-guided tour of the island. But I th really think the best way is to take one of our free docent tours every Friday and Sunday morning. And uh, you get the full history of the garden. You actually are standing in the places where those historic photos were taken. And after that, you can go do the cell house. Um, we also have a really great website, too, and everything is on there. Um, all our before and after questions, um, a blooming gallery, too, so you can really, like, you know, know a lot about the island. Um, I did forget to say um, there's a quiz. <laughs> so um, I also, before um, the quiz, on your brochures, um, on the back, if you do want to support us, we have a Corolla Ashford Fund. Um, Corolla passed away in 2009, and uh, we have a memorial fund for her to help um, support the gardens that she was so passionate about. Um, we also have for purchase our uh, photo book that's upstairs. Um, has a lot of great shots in there taken by myself and another lady. And um, I know the ladies of the Floral Legion have their catalog for purchase as well. And um, now we'll do the quiz. So I apologize, I didn't give you a little heads up, but you should be able to get these. Um, okay, first one, name three of the five garden areas. Yes, Kelly. Yes, very good. Anyone else need two more? Prisoners? Yeah, okay, good. 
Uh, OK, what was the inmate Elliot Michener convicted of? Counterfeiting. Uh, oh, OK. What is the secret ingredient in the compost? Worms, yes. Um, OK, once you're on the island, how much does it cost to take the docent tour? Free. And what is the name of the organization that runs the day to day? Who I work for? Yeah, I heard it in there. Okay, thank you. Um, um, well, thank you so much. It's been a very pleasure to speak with you. Um, um.